Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA's monthly conversation with faith leaders and peace and justice activists. And we're going to get started in just about two minutes. We're just giving some folks uh, another moment to uh, go ahead and join us. Um, in the meantime, for anybody who's not familiar with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, we are the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in the United States and possibly in the entire world, though I can't quite confirm that. And we have been advocating for nonviolence um, since 1914 in Europe and 1915 in the United States. I'm really lucky to be, really honored to be joined today by my colleague um, who runs the Fellowship of Reconciliation Palestine out of Bethlehem, Palestine, and is the newly elected president of the committee for the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. We have about 50 chapters, um, FOR chapters around the world, including in occupied Palestine. And uh, so Zugby El Zugby is live with us from Bethlehem, and I'll be introducing him in just a moment. Um, I used to spend uh, about a month or two per year in Palestine, uh, working on the ground uh, with nonviolent grassroots activists. And I did that until uh, 2018 when Israel deported me for my work. Um, and, and, you know, I, I miss it dearly. I miss um, Jerusalem and Hebron and Bethlehem. And, um, you know, I know it's, it's only because of such vile racism that um, we don't have peace there in the birthplace of the three major religions. So we're gonna uh, now talk directly to Zugby Al Zugby. Um, Zugby is, um, he's, he's uh, the founding director of the WM Palestinian Conflict Resolution Center in Bethlehem. And it's located at the entrance for anybody who's been to Bethlehem. I saw my, my dear, dear friend, Carolyn Karcher is on the uh, phone who was with me the very first time I went to Palestine and we um, got off the bus in Bethlehem um, at the entrance to the Ida refugee camp, which is where the WM Palestinian Conflict Resolution Center is located at that entrance um, that Zugby founded and is president of, and we're immediately tear gas. So for folks who are familiar uh, with Bethlehem up against the apartheid wall, you see my dear friend, uh, my roommate then Susan is also on. So um, without any further waiting, I am honored to introduce uh, Zugby, Zugby to you. Zugby, and we just bring him right on. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Hello. Hello, Ariel. Hello. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you. And um, I see we still have folks joining, and um, including who I imagine is a distant cousin of yours, uh, Dr. James Zugby. Welcome, Zugby. Thank you for Thank being you. here with us. It is a great honor to be with you and uh, hopefully uh, to see you again in the Holy Land to make it more sacred because of your presence and involvement in nonviolence and in the peacemaking everywhere. So I wanted to start um, kind of way back at the beginning. And um, I've been wanting to ask you, because I got a chance to talk to you the other day, but so I've been wanting to ask you your family story, whether you were originally from Bethlehem or you ended up there as refugees and what happened to your family in uh, 1948? I believe um, we are from Bethlehem, my family, 
But of course, our relatives and part of my family have land in uh, what is now uh, West Jerusalem. So every Palestinian family has been impacted by uh, the catastrophe, the Nakba, um, in terms of losing land, in terms of be become refugees, in terms of uh, moving from place to place and uh, having uh, fear and having uh, experienced the displacement. So the Palestinians in general have been living the Nakba since 1948. So it is, is not an event that happened in 1948. It has been happening since 1948. Absolutely. And um, so for anybody who's not familiar on this call, 1948 is when um, the state of Israel was founded and over 700,000 Palestinians were forcibly displaced from their homes and lands and in um, horrific war crimes, uh, the burning of villages, massacres, um, the forcing out of people from their homes. And, uh, and then in 1967, um, Israel conquered the West Bank as well, which remains under a brutal military occupation. Um, can you tell me what happened to your family in, in 1967? And um, yes, please. Yes, uh, in 1967, I remember I was four years old. So, um, you know, that's uh, the story that uh, I remember the airplanes, the uh, tanks, the fear and uh, the disbursement of our family members here and there. And on top of that, we used to have uh, two caves in, uh, in my home uh, area. So many of the people came to uh, hide in these caves, uh, waiting to see what will happen in the future. And uh, of course, uh, uh, some people and some relatives we lost in 1967. Uh, we don't know what happened to them. Uh, up till this moment, many of them are not uh, sure what happened. They are lost, they are killed, of course, they didn't come back to life. And uh, many uh, family members uh, moved outside the West Bank. What happened in 1948, again happened in 1967 to a smaller level, but it creates havoc, it creates another tragedy, and Israel occupied the remnant of historic Palestine. And of course, uh, the situation has not been as the same before 1967. So the history still uh, going on with injustice to the Palestinian people up till this moment. Absolutely. Uh, now, I, I specifically want to ask you, um, actually, first, uh, a bit about your faith, because um, often people think of Palestinians only as Muslim but you in fact are a Christian Palestinian. And if you could talk a bit about growing up as, as a Christian um, in the birthplace of, of Jesus and uh, what your faith means to you. Um, and also folks are asking if you can tilt your computer down a little bit so we can see you a little bit better. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, if you could um, talk a bit about your, your faith and, and also, um, how your faith led you to your beliefs in nonviolence? Well, um, I am a member of a Christian family, Arab Palestinian Christian. When I say Arab Palestinian Christian, is unholy trinity, by the way, it's not the holy trinity, Arab Palestinian and Christian. I was born in the city of Bethlehem. Uh, you know, my family is ecumenical. I have uh, my brothers and sisters belonging to different churches. So we are very ecumenical in that sense. And of course, I learned a lot of nonviolence through my mother, who was a woman uh, of faith and uh, is not uh, committed to one uh, church, but open for other faiths as well as different denominations. Uh, some people might ask us from the West, since when you are a Christian, and my kids tell me, please tell them 
that my great great grandmother was the babysitter of Jesus. So we have been a historic, uh, you know, in our church, in our faith. And my faith led me to enhance the nonviolent struggle and the uh, principles of nonviolence as part of in my faith uh, through openness, through inclusivity, through uh, uh, committing to the work, to the uh, belief, to the practice of nonviolence on all fronts. Absolutely. Um, speaking of, of your faith and, and of Christianity, what was um, Christmas like? this year in Bethlehem, both the, the beautiful and, and I'm sure, unfortunately, also ugly because of the military occupation. Well, you know, you can't believe it still we are in the time of Christmas. Tomorrow is the Christmas Eve for the Armenian uh, people, Armenian faith. So in a way or another, we celebrate three dates for Christmas. It seems that, um, our uh, uh, activities will continue from December uh, 25th till uh, January 19th. And we will say in that line, may the Christmas spirit uplift us as well as enhance our uh, walk and talk of nonviolence, inclusivity and pluralism. Um, and when we talk about Christmas, you know, many of us, you reflect on the story of the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. Many of us believe still our children are born at the time of occupation as Jesus was under the Roman occupation. And uh, the story continues to happen. Uh, many of our people um, took refuge in outside. Um, they, uh, Herod still in control not only in Palestine, but also in the in countries of the Middle East. But at, at the same time, we feel that injustice will not last forever. And uh, this is the spirit of Christmas that we can celebrate life and not death at the end of the story. Absolutely. And, and if you could say that uh, Christmas greeting for us in, in Arabic. كل عام وانتم بخير عيد ميلاد مجيد لكم جميعا. Thank you. Um, can I ask you now to talk a bit about uh, life in, in Bethlehem under occupation and apartheid um, and what it's like specifically in Ida refugee camp and, and for the young people of Bethlehem? You know, uh, Bethlehem is becoming smaller. Bethlehem is a walled city in a way or another. And this is the first time in history Bethlehem is separated from Jerusalem, you know? And the entrance of Bethlehem is blocked. And Palestinians are not free to go in and out of Bethlehem without going through the checkpoint. And when we talk about checkpoint, the Israeli occupation forces the Palestinians to go through one checkpoint only and through walking and not having our cars to go from and come back to Bethlehem uh, by car. So uh, we are circled by the wall, which is twice the height of Berlin wall, five times the Berlin wall length. And we are surrounded by the settlements. There are 23 settlements surrounding Bethlehem and 25 outposts uh, you know, and the Israeli government, the Israeli occupation controls of 87% of Bethlehem governorate. And uh, so what is left for people from Bethlehem, the city and the surrounding is less than 13% uh, to have for our kids, for our future, but also it is disconnected, it's not uh, geographically, geographically connected with each other. So, um, and our office just at the a wall and amazingly um, from time to time we are tear gassed uh, and we see a lot of events in front of our office, especially because 
It is the gathering for young people, for children, for women to protest against the injustices uh, done by the occupation. And uh, always we have a free tear gas and we have a free skunk water on, on the neighborhood. And besides live ammunition and uh, you know bullets, tear gas bullets, uh, I mean, rubber bullets and so on. So, um, and we are closer to also either refugee camp in a way or another, it is the most place which has been gassed uh, in the occupied territories. Uh, and all the gates that lead us to go into the highway between Jerusalem and Bethlehem are closed. So we are in a prison. And I believe if Martin Luther King is alive, he will write a letter from Bethlehem jail. Absolutely, absolutely, Martin Luther King wrote. So could you talk about your work, your center um, for conflict resolution and what you do, your, your peacemaking work in, in Bethlehem? And I also want to let folks know that we'll be putting a link in the chat for folks to make a, a donation to uh, support uh, the center as well. Um, you know, I'll I established the center, we am. We am in Arabic means agape, unconditional love. And we thought instead of uh, having a negative terminology, we will have a more positive, the Palestinian Center for Conflict Transformation. And this is a challenge, how to transform the garbage of anger, the garbage of hate into flower and tree of compassion. What we do in our center, we focus on our local issues, as well as on the level of advocacy and intercultural and interfaith uh, dialogue. Uh, the, mo the most important action of our work is the conflict transformation among our families. You know, it is a good season for conflict. There has been a deteriorating economic, political conditions since uh, 1967. And of course, this trigger internal conflict. And we mediate conflict uh, through uh, nonviolent ways among our families, among our neighbors. And uh, of course, this is uh, peacemaking within the society. On the other level, we are struggling against the injustice of the occupation through the nonviolent ways, the nonviolent protest, the nonviolent struggle. And, uh, and on top of that, we have a program of advocacy to raise the awareness in the world, to raise the awareness in the groups coming to Palestine, to tell them about our story and about our uh, justice, about our struggle, and about our yearning for to live in peace and justice here and there. And we try to give the example uh, to the new generation that the, we should adopt the nonviolent struggle to move forward to have a better future, despite the situation is getting worse and worse. And so therefore we try to have a holistic approach because we are a community-based society and the family is a viable socioeconomic unit. So we have programs for women, uh, you know, talking about United Nations 1325, uh, peace, women and security, and uh, also SEDAW, the Convention on Elimination of All Discrimination Against Women, and with other groups and with other women organizations, we try to uh, encourage the authority to endorse the family law protection. This is one thing on women. The other thing we work on uh, the kids program because our kids have trauma and we try to have trauma coping skills and not trauma healing because we don't have the post-traumatic stress disorder. It is an ongoing trauma, layer after layer. So we try to provide our kids with a safe environment to ventilate, to air out through art therapy, through theater, through dancing, through trips to the nature, through environmental awareness. And, uh, you know, 50% of our kids, our people are under the age of 15. The third, we have program for youth. You know, 70% of our population under the age of 30. 
and the things you have for granted in the West, our young people die to achieve it. So there is a theft of spontaneity and it is, there is not a freedom to move uh, and we have the unemployment skyrocketing. And uh, of course, uh, one third of the male population have been in jail. So we try to work with the youth to find ways, not only to ventilate, but to be active in the society and to work to uh, create a better atmosphere for themselves and for the generations to come. And of course, we talk about uh, uh, family. Uh, we have lots of programs with families. So this is uh, in a nutshell what we do. So I've put the, the link in the chat to help support the center and um, if folks want to donate, but I, I want to ask a larger question and I also just want to say hello to um, Zogby's dear friend Don Wagner, who I see is on this call and who um, I worked under, had the, had the great pleasure of working under a number of years ago. Um, what can what can we do aside from um, giving money, which is which is of course you know a very important thing to do, and um, among the suffering in Palestinians is is a, an economy that is also um, strangled under occupation. And I could go into we could go into details about that, but that's a a longer conversation about the ways in which Israel strangles the, the Palestinian economy and um, what poverty can be like, especially in the refugee camps. So certainly um, donations are needed for programs. But what what else can we do? Um, and Don asked specifically, um, what can Christians do? Like what are the best ways for us to advocate, um, whether uh, you would suggest engaging in, in boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or um, other types of advocacy that you recommend, educational advocacy, and so on. Please tell us how to help. You are asking Don or me? Yeah, no, no, sorry, I'm asking you. <laughs> but John okay. sent me a message. Okay. That he I, I, believe, so. <laughs> uh, I believe what is really needed is to see you more and to have more groups to come here because we want you to have firsthand knowledge from the scene that you saw uh, and uh, observe. We can say, come and observe, reflect, and act. So and we don't want you to be pro-Palestinian. We want people to come and to be pro-justice. Second, I think we need uh, to impact the policy of the United States in the long run, because you come from a great power, and always we say great power is associated with the great responsibility. And I hope the American people will be able to help others to be liberated, especially if we take the Boston Tea Party, where you raise, where you have uh, under the slogan, no taxation without representation. Third, I believe it is wonderful to see you and you have been as a volunteer in the area. So coming and to be living with the Palestinians and helping in different organizations will lead to a different understanding. And by this, you are able to uh, create dialogue, you know, and to create a kind of relationship. As Margaret Wheatley will say, it is impossible to create a healthy culture if we refuse to meet and if we refuse to listen. But if we meet and when we listen, we reweave the world into wholeness and holiness. This is very important to enhance the dialogue between the West and the East, between the different faiths, between the different cultures. So what is needed to be together in our struggle for justice everywhere. As Martin Luther King says, any injustice anywhere is a fringe on justice everywhere. So your presence here, your relationship with us and inviting Palestinians and peace activists in Israel to come to talk in your churches, mosque, 
synagogues in your communities help to create a different synergy. And this is needed, especially nowadays, where we see the whole world is focusing on violence, conflict, and war. And so it is a different scenario that we are asking for, for better understanding, for creating better uh, atmosphere, and to have dialogue between people and to replace the dialogue of arms by arms dialogue. And we need that arms dialogue. That means we extend our hands to uh, dialogue. So uh, what is hopefully needed, please, as Americans, ask where your tax money goes. And uh, we love to see the tax money goes for a better atmosphere for the peoples everywhere. And I think we appreciate what you do and what you uh, have been doing and your thoughts and your minds in alleviating the suffering uh, of people in different parts of the world. And we don't want the world to focus only on the Palestinian issue, to focus on the injustice in Latin America, Africa. And also we appreciate your voice because your voice always tried to tell the world, come on and see, because the world now is focusing on the Ukraine issue and the governments have a double standard where the uh, weapons and support to Ukrainian by billions by, and gives arms and legitimacy to struggle. While if we struggle nonviolently, many times we are labeled as extremist or terrorist. So we want uh, through you and through the collective responsibility that we have together uh, to have even handed policy if we can and not to blame us for our struggle and to find common ground for understanding to seek justice on different levels. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of, of the variety of faiths, um, what, are, what are Muslim and Christian relations uh, like both in Bethlehem and, and across Palestine? I believe, um, you know, when we are asked who is a Palestinian in the past and up till this moment, we say a Palestinian means a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, uh, uh, Samaritan, Druze, because this is the diversity that we used to have in Palestine, in historic Palestine, and Israel and Palestine now. We are talking about uh, pluralism, uh, and the Palestinian used to be the most secular people. Yes, they have their faith, and most of our faith is based on personal relationship with the Creator. So our relationship with our Muslim brothers and sisters uh, going in the right direction. Um, we try to be united for justice, to liberate us from uh, the occupation. And when we talk about Palestinian Muslims and Christians, we are one group against the injustice. And of course, we shouldn't forget the just groups in Israel, although they are small, uh, but they are a ray of hope who struggle against the injustices against the Palestinians. So in a way or another, we all united in the struggle against injustice. And you saw in the last uh, few days, uh, I couldn't say that they, all of them are justice peace groups who demonstrate in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, the students uh, in the different uh, universities in Israel against the new formation of the government. So I feel we cannot do it alone. We need three dimensions of the struggle, the Palestinians to continue their proactive approach of nonviolence to get rid of the occupation, the uh, pro-justice group, although they are small, still they are ray of hope to have a preventive approach of nonviolence to help their government to get rid of the occupation and uh, third party, third party like you and other uh, agencies on the government level, on UN levels, to empower the weak, but to bring the strong to their uh, sen senses and not to their needs. 
So as uh, Palestinians here and there, uh, hopefully to continue with this uh, unity and we believe in diversity in unity. And uh, this is where hope lies and where salvation could happen. Thank you. Um, so we talk about hope and not much to hope for right now from the Israeli government. They're not giving us um, much to hope for. Uh, how have you seen an effect on the ground um, from this new government, which is um, the furthest, the most right wing, most far, far violent, racist, extremist government that Israel has has seen is in its entire history. And that's just to give our audience a little bit of context. Um, but what's it been like to be on the, the receiving end of the most violent and racist government in Israel's history? We see an escalation of violence. There is no single day passes without people killed and especially kids, you know? And in the Hesha camp, we have already a few kids were killed. Uh, recently, and uh, fathers in Shafat uh, camp and other places. So there is a series of killing, and uh, these uh, approaches have never been seen like that, target killing. Second, more imprisonment of young people and kids. Uh, every night we hear jeeps going on the streets here and there, imprisoning people. And of course, demolishing of houses more and more at alarming rate, uh, confiscation of land, expanding settlements. Uh, even the government is not really, um, has been for a long time, but we see the symptoms. The attack on the holy places, you know, uh, to go in the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque area, uh, uh, you know, the attack on the cemetery of the Anglican Church and the Lutheran Church uh, recently in Mount Zion, uh, the attack on even some churches inside Israel in the north, you know? Uh, and I believe this is a strange thing, but uh, as you know, Israel is moving more to the right wing. When Israel was created, it was more a secular, agnostic, and, uh, you know, uh, community. Uh, and it is, was created by uh, some uh, socialist people, despite it, the occupation is occupation. But nowadays, we see a trend moving more to the right wing. And this is very dangerous because we don't want to see a holy war, you know, based on uh, Muslim and uh, Jewish. Uh, some people try to create uh, a holy war between uh, Muslims and Jews uh, are in involving, of course, of Arab Christians. And I don't want to see that because religious wars are much more dangerous than any other wars. I don't want to have a seat in heaven to conquer the enemy. I want to live in dignity, in peace, in justice, side by side with others who would like to move in this less traveled road. So uh, I am afraid if the uh, Jewish uh, people all over the world will not ex exercise any pressure on this government and the uh, free world and the Western world will not impact this government, it will lead us to a terrible situation. And the occupation does not demoralize us only, it will demoralize Israelis and Jews. And we say to many friends, who come to say that we come to save the soul of Israel. And I say, if you want to save the soul of Israel, help Israel to get rid of the occupation of the occupied territories. So uh, I feel uh, we need, again, to assume collective responsibility in ending this occupation and also uh, changing the this kind of uh, uh, arrangement within the state of Israel, because uh, what will happen to 2 million Palestinians living in Israel? What would happen to the people who are not religiously right? How can we talk about freedom of conscience? How, you know, 
again, occupation and democracy does not go together. Absolutely. So we're going to soon open it up for questions. And so I want to, I, I know there's already a lot of questions going on in the chat, but um, feel free to put your questions in the chat and I'll be bringing on my colleague, Bill McGarvey, and he'll um, gather them and um, try to ask them in, uh, in, in sort of bunches or you know, to, uh, curate them so that we can um, hear from you as, as best as possible. Um, but before we do that, I, I just want to um, make a call as well to, as you said, this is the, the responsibility of Jews worldwide. And um, you know there are so many of us that are that are part of the struggle. I, I had this. Uh, I got this incredible email yesterday from my my hometown rabbi, the rabbi at my synagogue in the, in the small town of Ithaca, New York, Rabbi Shifra, who said um, she got the email about today's event, and she said, "Oh, I, I, my family and I stayed with his family in 2001 and 2002." So. Um, this is a small world, and, and Zugby and I were, were talking about that, that I see um, my friend and Zugby's dear friend, Diane Rowe, is on, um, that there's, there's many of us. And so within that, before I bring Bill on, um, I'll ask one final question myself. Um, so this is a lot of what gives me hope. What, what gives you hope? Well, uh, I believe people like you and the many who are uh, with us are renewable source of hope, you know, because uh, you are giving a message that Palestinians are not alone. The oppressed are not alone. And this uh, gives me hope. Other hope comes from, um, you know, that uh, from historical events. The apartheid regime in South Africa is no longer there. Yet we know that there is no absolute justice uh, on the economic level, on the social level, political level, but uh, the system has changed. Uh, uh, Berlin Wall fell down, you know, um, after 28 years of being built. Uh, the uh, conflict in Northern Ireland is no longer. The Republicans and the conservatives are sharing the government. This is historical events as Martin Luther King says injustice will not last forever. Uh, of course, hope with the youth that uh, we see in Palestine, yet they are deprived of many things, but still they are thinking how to have a better future. They invest in education. They try to, despite that there is not a lot of jobs waiting for them, but they try to think that education is the only answer. And if you come to our homes in the refugee camps in the villages and the cities, you will see certificates of education, graduation of even kids in the uh, local schools have their certificate on the wall and not guns. Despite now uh, the situation is really a violent atmosphere uh, as a result of the new government, as well as the world is giving us an example through guns, we will solve the problem, but still our people in a way or another are a people who struggle to achieve justice, to create a better atmosphere. My kids give me hope. My wife gives me hope, who is uh, from America, is not allowed to live with me uh, since we got married in 1990. For 32 years, she is struggling to have a visa to be here. She is trying to have family unification and the power to be is not allowing her. And uh, for example, in the coming uh, weeks, she is going to leave. And then when she leaves, she will apply for a visa to come here. It's despite that, the fact that she is American and Americans have three month visa automatically when they arrive at the airport. The power to be here, the occupation prevented her to uh, fly and to come back through Tel Aviv airport, the Lod airport, but my wife for the 32 years continue to believe there should be a way out of this tyranny, out of this oppression, and we need. And my kids who are educated in the US are looking forward to that time to come here despite it is difficult, 
despite not allowing, and many of them uh, suffer the injustices like their uh, siblings, like their cousins, their, uh, like their uh, uh, compatriots in the village, in the city, in the refugee camp. So, um, and I see more hope also, despite of all destruction, I see our people even plant some flowers and trees, despite there is a shortage of water in our area, the people would like to live and to celebrate life and not death. This is, gives me more hope. So uh, before I bring Bill on, I see that um, Dr. James Zogby has his hand up and um, I'm going to invite him in, who I believe, and he and I have discussed that he's likely a relative of yours. Um, oh, that's Bill. Welcome, Bill. I'm gonna bring you on as well. Hi. Um, Hello. Uh, hi. My, my family calls you the 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 guy who loved the name so much he named himself twice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a humble first name, James. But uh, listen, I, I I've so appreciated this conversation and your description of the circumstances. But I'm deeply troubled by the story you tell. And Ariel has mentioned to me your uh, your family situation. Could you send me a letter uh, outlining the difficulties? I would like to work on it uh, for you. This, this issue has long troubled me and I'd like to see what I could do to help. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, anything you can do about your wife and your kids, uh, this, is, this is deplorable and it's something I'd like to work on. And thank you for everything you do. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're just a marvelous, uh, marvelous leader here. And um, and uh, and thank Ariel for bringing us together here. Um, I, and I did put in a chat thing. The first time I became aware of the 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 Zuchbis in uh, in Bethlehem was at a Bethlehem conference here in the states. Uh, and uh, the the mother of pearl work that was done by I think it was George uh, was the name I recall. It was in the 19th century and thrones for monarchs in Europe and. They wanted, you know, something from the Holy Land, and the 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 most renowned craftsmen were were from the Zogby family. So, um, you are a craftsman of a different sort, and <laughs> I, I appreciate the work you do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ariel. You are humbling me, uh, James. And uh, my father called me Zogby Zogby because he ran out of names after <laughs> eight children. <laughs> So, and because the Arabic translation is fuzzy, you're fuzzy fuzzy. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Thank you so much. And yeah. send me the letter. I'd like to like to see what I could do to help. Thank Jim, you. I will follow up with both you and Zubi. Please. And um, we'll all work together on this specifically. Great. And each individual yeah. case that we work on is part of the um larger struggle to liberate the Palestinian people and I want to welcome um my colleague and right hand in this work uh Bill McGarvey um Bill you have the the, the task of gathering the many questions that I saw coming through in the chat into the 15 minutes we have left so um, yeah, I've been getting my phone's been blowing either in the chat and my phone getting texts. People have my text has been really great. And thank you for the conversation so far. Uh got a number of questions that we want to people please to continue to, to send to add questions in the chat if they'd like. A couple of questions about nonviolent uh means, and one from David Hartsaw was interesting. Uh, what do the average Palestinians see as a nonviolent means for struggle for liberation? Uh, and a peace for a peaceful and just future. Do you have any thoughts on on what maybe yes. the average Palestinian would think in terms of what's nonviolent? You know, um, when I was younger, I wouldn't use the word uh, pacifist and uh, that naked uh, term. I used the unarmed struggle because we want to uh, associate nonviolence with struggle. So uh, the Palestinians, as others, are diverse in their approach. There are Palestinian young people who have been struggling in nonviolence throughout their uh, you know, years. And uh, whether we talk about this term and what does it mean, but they practice it. And the Palestinians in general 
have been practicing unarmed struggle as well, a small percentage with armed struggle. And together we created uh, this kind of uh, work. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Palestinians resorted to nonviolence from the time at the, uh, under the British, uh, what they call it, British mandate up till this moment. So um, uh, we can say that uh, most of the Palestinians who have been in prison, you know, especially kids and young people, uh, were under administrative detention, and uh, which is under the British emergency regulation laws, uh, which in a way says every Palestinian is guilty until proven innocence. But Israel has been putting them in jail based on this uh, approach. So, uh, and the Palestinians used uh, different uh, uh, tactics. We have symbolic forms of nonviolent protest. Uh, we have non-cooperation. And uh, this is uh, the Palestinians use nonviolence uh, throughout the history and uh, through international diplomacy. So, uh, but many people think of nonviolence as a very narrow concept for some practices, but it is a broad concept. And for me, for example, hope is a form of nonviolent struggle, you know? And um, um, so despite the fact nowadays, and basically as a result of the Korean war, many Palestinians would question, will be able to liberate ourselves through nonviolence, what happened to the double standard of the world? So um, I believe the events on the global level has weakened our uh, youth adherence to nonviolence because what they see is that the world is pushing towards uh, using violence to liberate themselves. And uh, it is not easy. And despite the fact that nothing has changed. Um, so we are, uh, you know, weathering the weather uh, and uh, try to enhance hope with our youth. So uh, we see people struggling nonviolence, very few use arms. Uh, some try to immigrate and leave because they don't want to see more bloodshed and they don't see there's a hope here. And others just focus on bringing some honey and milk on the table. Thank you. Another good question, similar as you can imagine, because the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a lot of concern is around issues of nonviolence, et cetera. And Marie Dennis, a uh, longtime Pax Christi uh, and a longtime friend of FOR, um, asked a similar question, but is there a network or coalition of Palestinian organizations developing sort of nonviolent strategies for promoting justice in Palestine? Like any sort of network or is that happening on the ground there? There is there has been better networking than now, you know? Um, been better uh, in the past than now. Yes, yeah, yeah. in the past, uh, not only during the uh, first uprising of 1987 to 1993, but throughout uh, the years. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't um, exclude the Israeli policies against those who adhere to nonviolence. Many of them have been in jail. Uh, but still, there are some pockets of nonviolence in the North and the South. And if you come to Palestine and you see the workers struggle to get up at three o'clock to go to the checkpoint, to go to their work in early morning and come back at six in the evening, what they call this, I, for me, this is also nonviolent to look at the students who struggle to go to their universities, despite of many checkpoints here and there. This is nonviolence. To see the farmers who are not allowed to go freely to their uh, orchards, you know, also form of nonviolence. Uh, to see the different, again, pockets of nonviolence against house demolition in Masafir Yatta in the south or in the Jordan Valley or in E1 or in Jerusalem to protect the holy places and to protect uh, the housing in Sheikh Jarrah. 
So I, I believe nonviolence is not only a demonstration or a vigil as many might look, but to talk about the practices on daily life, to have steadfastness, I believe, to have the steadfastness of our people against this machinery of war is a form of nonviolence. To have the resilience mm -hmm. and the compassion to be together and uh, to work together. Uh, so this is, you know, continue to be uh, a witness for nonviolent activities. Uh, but at the same time, we understand that where we are now is not helping to promote uh, uh, the struggle of nonviolence on higher levels. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a great answer. Uh, powerful. Uh, and just to, there's a question. Yes, this event is being recorded and will be put online probably in the next couple of days, just so you know. Got a good question here uh, from John Elder uh, about the current government. What is the likelihood of the Netanyahu government over that the government will overplay its repression of Palestine? Uh, he comments that there are signs already of American pro-Zionist groups becoming critical of extreme repression. Do you have any sense of that? I see. Mo I, I, could I... Uh, could you repeat the question again? Sure. Is the there time. a likely? Do, do you think there's a likelihood that the Netanyahu, the current Netanyahu government, will overplay its repression of Palestinians? And the comment is, the question has come because they, he see the the questioner says he sees some signs of uh, already in American pro-Zionist groups are becoming critical of the extreme repression. Do you see any sign of that, you know, happening with this new government? I I, I couldn't predict, but. Uh, I think Netanyahu um, will be seen as more uh, in the middle uh, versus Smodrich and Benny Gver. Uh, and uh, I, there might be more oppression, and we see it, more uh, cracking down on the Palestinians. At the same time, uh, probably I hope that the world will exert pressure to stop uh, this kind of craziness in this government. So, uh, and we see escalation of violence on all levels, escalation on also in legislating different laws or what they call reforming of the laws uh, to serve the power to be. And uh, um, I, and to have 65 members of the Knesset in this government and there is this government and even more to 74 it is a you know catastrophe also uh, i hope the jewish voices for peace for uh, justice uh, will be much more and the world should be uproar uh, but at the same time netanyahu plays the role uh, to gather more support because he is waging a war on iran uh, the Ukrainian issue really uh, cover the crimes that this government might happen and might do to the Palestinians. And the world is busy with this issue or that issue. So uh, I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic, but I think with people like you and with this gathering to hear, and uh, there might be much more work on the ground and to have a grassroots uh, gathering, an international approach to exert pressure on the power to be, uh, to create a different synergy. Any other creative ways about how we, people in our audience here, we have about 85 people that got here today, how we can help from where we are in whatever place we can do, whatever we can do, any small actions people could start right I now? Writing letters, talking to your uh, representatives, uh, you know, having more groups to expose the atrocities in the West Bank, to have dialogue and to encourage the peace camp, uh, justice camp in Israel to have a unique relationship with the local Palestinians, to have empathy and to have solidarity, uh, as well as um, to exert pressure through uh, vigils, through demonstration. I, I think what you are doing is great, but at the same time, we shouldn't think that uh, it will be solved in weeks or months. It, is, it has been happening for a long time, but if we can mobilize more masses 
if we can faith-based organization. We need now the faith-based with others to work together to say this is not what religion is about. Religious practices are not a source of conflict, but a resource for coexistence, for peace building, for the culture of acceptance rather than uh, you know domination. And we together need to say Jerusalem shouldn't be under one religious control or one political control because uh, we don't want again to see wars of religion start in Jerusalem. And we shouldn't minimize the impact of Benny uh, Gvir or Smodrich on the issue of Jerusalem and how to create incitement and uh, create unhealthy relationship between people of faith. Thank you very much. It's been such a great honor talking to you. And we're almost at the hour mark, so I'm going to hand this back to Ariel. Thank you for all the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything, but I think Ariel has a, a sort of send off yeah. of prayer that she wants to do. Yeah, so I'm going to start um, specifically bringing into the spotlight some folks who um, are either big fans of yours or dear friends, including my colleague uh, Chris Ney, who you met, um, got to know you in Juba. And as I do that, um, I'm wondering if you would, our tradition here at FOR USA is we like to um, end our meetings with a prayer or a blessing. And so I'm wondering if you would uh, lead one for us and I'll ask folks to um, unmute themselves and we can all um, listen and say amen. Thank you. May our common God help us to see the reality as it is and to move us to work for justice and continue to see others as brothers and sisters and to continue with our yearning for a better future through our common God and to bless all of your walks and talks toward justice and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And um, I'll just let folks know that we'll be sending out this video and we will also do some follow up. Um, I how to reach out to your representatives and make an ask of them um, to support Palestinian rights. So thank you, everybody. And Blessings and um, freedom, Palestine. Thank you, Zogby. Thank you very much, and thank God you. bless. And thank thanks so for much. all your efforts. Thank you, Zogby. Thank, thank you, Zogby. Thank you, Zogby. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lifting you to the light. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been at this for so long. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we met you so many we met you many years ago and you probably yeah. don't remember us yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. You do remember we stayed at your house yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm so so glad to see you. Thank you so sorry so many of the things are the same yes I'm sorry to hear that and we continue to hope yes take care you're welcome Bye, Sibby. Thank you, everybody.